Hi everyone and welcome to today's session. So today we'll be continuing our discussion on Cradle, one of the latest papers that could play a very difficult game or rather a more advanced game such as Red Dead Redemption 2 where you control a character you need to navigate through like the environment, you know, ride your horse, choose your weapons and so on. So this game is a, a little harder than like the games that people usually do research on like um, Atari games or like games that you know don't have such rich graphics so there's a lot of things that you need to do with this and last week we talked a little bit about how this is done so i just do a big a brief recap so the key things that i like about this paper is the day is the way that they do various abstraction spaces and they do it in two forms the first form is in the image domain so last week we talked quite extent extensively about this image domain how they use gpt4v to I asked the GPT-4V to read out the various portions of the image. Okay, they did not do it like Vista where they crop out the different UI elements and ask GPT to do OCR. They asked GPT to directly do OCR on the image itself, which turns out to be quite well already, maybe because it's quite clear. So you'll be able to get the stuff like the tasks over here, like what, what to do, like the tasks can be seen on the screen, some actions that you need to do, all this can be processed by GPT. Okay, and then they give some context, like, you know, this is a left mouse button. Yep. And then over here, there's a mini map that, you know, you could use to see a location. But again, GPT-4V is not that accurate at processing it. Sometimes it, it doesn't know how to interpret the, the angle of that mini map arrow here. So they had to prompt it to say that, oh, give me the angle of the arrow and so on. Um, other than using GPT-4V direct, actually, they pass in the screenshot to this thing called grounding Dino to basically extract out key stuff like you know this bounding box for the horse you know based on the tasks here like get bounding box for the horse or bounding box for other things of interest and also there's this thing called the um, multi-template matching where they match different templates like for example your mini map if your white arrow is like that sometimes gpd doesn't know this is the arrow for the person so they have to use some template matching in order to find out oh, where's the the bounding box for this arrow so this is not just uh, the normal image itself it's just the image plus augmentations from grounding dino which is basically bounding boxes and then we also have the multi template matching to find out icons so it's a little bit of a, a hack around here to to get the important information I think this is important because in the image domain, if you just pass it directly to GPT-4V, you may not be able to get the right stuff, okay? Because GPT-4V may not infer the image correctly. So this is the idea of multiple abstraction spaces. Like in the image domain, you want to have different abstraction spaces so that you can process the image in meaningful um, spaces, get the information you need, and then you combine them together. So they did it um, pretty nicely here. Of course, there could be other things like, you know, what's the motion of your object. You know, they could have used stuff like YOLO V8 to, you know, interpret between frames, what's the motion of the object, where is it going to, is the horse coming to you and so on. Now, that's not really done here. This is mainly done on a per frame basis. So the next thing is video. <laughs> so yeah, but this is not bad. So given how we interpret the image already, the next step to do is something called the self-reflection step. Basically, this is the way to find out whether a task is completed. So it's very similar to the task gen structure where everything follows a task. So your actions that you do follow this task. So there's this global task or this global objective that the system is trying to optimize. So in this case, maybe in this diagram, the global objective is lead the horse now, but the previous action, okay, or rather actually I think um, in this case, lead the horse is the global task. So we reflect based on the observation of the previous frames, okay, previous eight frames and so on. Okay, based on what has happened, we reflect, we basically ask GPT-4 to reflect on whether the task has been completed. So usually there are also a few short prompted to say that a hey, task is completed if you know the, the task over here changes. So it's a bit of a hack because like if your game doesn't tell you that the task has changed, then how do you know whether your task is completed, right? So I have my doubts about whether GPT-4V is able to you know, just tell you whether the task is completed without some in-game hints, All right? So this uh, system relies a lot on in-game hints, okay? But you can see that based on this, 
you can tell whether, you know, oh, I, I shy at the horse before that. Yeah. So now I need to lead the horse. So that's the next step. So this self-reflection step basically tells you whether the current task is completed. If it's not completed, okay, give suggestions of what to do. Okay, or give reasons for failures. So over here, um, they did not give the reason for failure because um, this is still ongoing. It's not like the task has failed. So this is just saying that, okay, this has been done. Okay, now let's go to the next step. So there's a series of further actions. And then now we need to process this further actions in task inference. So let's say that the, the task is still lead the horse. All right. <laughs> so what we need to do is we basically need to um, con continue this action, right? Because sometimes the action takes a while. So this self-reflection is also important in the sense that it, it maintains temporal awareness. Like it tells you, you know, what happened in the past so that you can continue the action next time. Okay, if you don't have this self-reflection step, you know, you may not be aware of like, you know, what you did before, what should I do next? So this self-reflection is very, very important. Uh, in task gen, also um, this is uh, in the next sub-step, uh, the next sub-task planner. So like to choose the next sub-task, you know, you need to reflect on what sub-task has been completed and then you choose the next one. So uh, they did not do it so clear cut over here. They just follow the main task. And in this case, the main task is lead the horse. So reflecting on this main task, the GPT-4 would take in the previous sequence of actions and the, the, the screenshots and then decide whether or not the task has been completed. Okay, so task inference is basically saying that, you know, should I change my task? So this task inference actually, if you look at the way they prompted in the code, the task inference comes purely or mainly from this screenshot here. So if the screenshot there put lead the horse, then they will do the task lead the horse. So again, it's a bit of a hack because they just follow what the screen tells them to do. Okay, so this task inference, um, it is basically update the current task. And there's a bit of uh there's a bit of of some engineering to this game because when they finish the task, they will go back to the previous long horizon task. So like maybe the long horizon task is to go to this town. But maybe as part of this task, you need to lead the horse. So again, the game will tell you like the what's the long horizon task, what's the short horizon task, and so on. You just need to follow this text box over here for the tutorial levels. And that's exactly what they did for this. Okay, so now suppose we already have our tasks. Next, we will go to skill curation. Skill curation has two parts. The, the first part of skill curation, okay, let me see the chat. Okay, yeah. The, skill, the first part of skill curation is basically to see the screen, okay, and infer what's the thing that is present on the screen. So like this show info, lead horse, all this is actually present in this menu over here. And that's what we do here. And then the other things here is basically based on procedural memory, what has been stored before that. And then we store it here and uh, we retrieve it and present this to the agent. So the agent based on this task, lead the horse, it will use some um, retrieval like cosine similarity to choose the skills that are relevant to lead the horse. And in this case, like show info, lead horse, turn, move forward. So based on this, there will be this very important step for action planning. And this is the step that I think LMs cannot do well. So even in task gen, there's also some issues with um, choosing the next subtask. It's because LM's, LM based planning is not able to you know, see the future. It's just able to tell you at this time instance, like what should I do next in a very vague way. So this action planning is not perfect, but at least for the very next action, it is quite reliable. Okay, so they have to do this action planning every single time step okay, to choose the next action to do. And this action is one of these um, functions. Okay, I call it a domain specific language, a DSL, because instead of like directly saying that, oh, I move my mouse or I, I type this key, you know, sometimes if I just call like some predefined functions, that have some meaningful names here, like lead horse, you know, draw weapon. It is easier for GPT to infer based on the function name than just the raw key press itself. So this is a uh, quite a useful technique to name your functions in a very semantically rich way, so that you can do you know cosine similarity on your function name as well as the function information. So that's what we do here. Okay, so this 
skill curation for the task leads to this uh, DSL here, which um, basically is a list of actions. And we execute the first one. Okay, after you execute, okay, you can basically proceed to, to see what's the next state again and you repeat the whole cycle. Okay, in between here, uh, we will store more and more things into the episodic memory, which is basically to store like what has happened in the past. You know, you summarize something and you store it here. Okay, this summary is very important. So this is another abstraction space. This summary that they did, okay, will be used by the action planner. It's used primarily by the action planner. Over here. To get global context. Okay. This is a very key question here. So I'd like to ask you, like, why did they put the summary into the action planner? Why not just take, you know, the past five frames and give the full information for the past five frames to the action planner and get it to output the list of actions? Now, why do you think they instead use the summary? A any, any, any opinion? I mean, there's a, that's technically you could keep the, the, context down right so you're summarizing is just gonna be shorter but also it's more hopefully it's more direct right there's not a um as it were the work to summarize has already been done you know by virtue of being a summary right so what happened look at the summary it'll tell you what happened you don't need to figure it out each time as it were so the it's just a more you know, direct way of saying what's been going on Mm. Yeah, actually, I think that's the main reason yeah. is because if you put the full information for the last five frames or X frames, yeah. there'll be context overload. And this also makes the LM a bit distracted because like there's so I mean, there's also one hidden step of inference that you need to do, like to summarize the five frames into one coherent mm. series that takes effort. So you split down into two steps. You let the summarizer do that step of getting the coherent time flow. And then you can just take that process step to, to do here. Yeah, so uh, there's this thing very important here. This is like a sequential or, or rather sequential modular functions. So like each LM only does one small part. This actually works better than, you know, than having one LM do everything. Because right now we only have GPT-4. Um, it's not able to do very complex inference yet. I mean, it's complex, but not there to the extent that I just dump in all the observation and expect you to get something out. Okay, so... This summary is actually part of the processing step. It helps to reduce the context. It also helps to make the workflow become more modular. And yeah, this is actually quite a useful technique because when you are doing the action planning, okay, you do not need like the information for every single state. You just need like a summary of like what's going what what's going on so you can make a decision of what to do next. It's like um if I'm talking to you right now, I just need a summary of like what I have said before to tell you what I should do next. I don't need the full context. At least not, not in most cases. There's one interesting thing about this summary part that I'll just highlight here is that the summary builds on the previous summary. So when they do the summary, they actually take the summary of the previous few time steps and they say, this is what, okay, let me just write it here. So this is how the summarization works. You have the summary of previous time steps and then you have current information. And then what you want to do is you want to get new summary. So you can see over here, um, they actually make it such that the summary length is approximately the same for each, each part. So in the paper, they say this is something like a recurrent neural network. Because in a recurrent neural network, you store a hidden state that carries over from time step to time step. In this case, the hidden state is not a list of fact it's not a vector representation like the traditional re recurrent neural network. This hidden state is actually in words. And then you just keep updating this summary based on the time step. Like right now I see lead the horse. I can update my summary. Like I've I've I'm shy, I've um I checked the shire of the horse and now I'm about to shire the horse. That, that could be a summary. After you shire the horse initially, you could say that I have successfully shire the horse, I've led the horse somewhere. So so that is like you can keep building on to your past history in a summarized way. And actually this method. Um, would be able to scale quite well because your summary summary will always be um, short. Um, but there's a small issue here if you have too long horizon is that if you have too much data incoming, but you only store this amount, this limited amount, you will lose information. 
So um, this only works if you know your task is not too long, you know, then your summary doesn't need to be too long as well. If your task is very, very long, you will likely forget what happened earlier. Okay, that's why, you know, usually people, when they do this memory, they not just have the summary, they also have the full memory, and then they do retrieval augmented generation on your full memory. Okay, here, um, they didn't really do that. <laughs> here is just the summary, and I think that worked for the game already. So, um, these are just some techniques that uh, people have been using in order to boost the um, context for like chatbots and so on. So, there's a short-term memory and a long-term memory. So, um, this summary here is like the... I guess you could treat it as like short-term memory because like you keep updating it. But the long-term memory part is like when you really have all the past history, you just retrieve what is relevant. Uh, that is not really done here. Okay. But I just want to highlight this part for the summary because I think that this summary is quite important in order for a performance system. Like you cannot just give the full raw context. Okay, a any questions here? All right. So let's go through how this cradle does the problem solving. So let's say I have seen an image here. Okay. And you can over here, you can see that they already said the task, right? Hold this tab button to show the weapon wheel. So immediately in the task inference step. So of course, there's a reflection step and so on. But in this case, this task inference step, we already, based on the image, we can extract out the task. And then we will follow this task because in the prompt, they emphasize that if the screen shows a task, do it. All right, so this is a bit engineered to this game. Okay, so I mean, it's quite an easy game, right? If you think about it, the tutorial level just tells you what to do. So the, the AI is just basically interpreting the, the screen. All right, so after that, what this is the, the useful part. And I also did something like this for task gen. The idea is based on your task. Okay, you don't need to show all the skills to the agent to choose, you know, because sometimes there's a thousand skills. You just choose those skills that are relevant to the agent. So over here, there's skills like aim, follow, turn, and so on. Yeah, that is based on the design similarity to your description of this task. Okay, so it's very important, okay, because a lot of this kind of systems use cosine similarity of the vector as a way to indicate relevance. It's very important to describe your task in the correct way. And at the same time, it's also very important to name your skills Okay, the name and the description of your skills need to be semantically similar to this. So this is something that uh, you need to watch out for if you are doing a system like this, is that the names matter. Okay, unlike traditional programming, where you can just label your functions, any, if any like function one, function two, um, in the LM-based uh, function retrieval, you, ne you need to name your functions well. Because if you don't name it well, you will have issues to link whatever task here to choose these skills. You will have issues choosing the right skills. Okay, so over here, they did not do something like what I did in time span. They did not do a memory to link the description to skills. So let's say if your skills really is like very, very bad name, you could say like hold tab to show weapon wheel is linked to function one. You could do that in memory. So rather than just doing the direct skill curation, you could have a memory buffer that gives you the linkage between this description to this function. And so it helps to draw the link between like the free flow text. So this is your this is your user user text to your action space. So if let's say you never name it well enough, right? You will need some form of a memory buffer to map your different user text here into the same action space here. So for example, this user text could be draw weapon. And then the user text also could be show weapon wheel. All right, and the action space, what we do, we'll, we'll just have multiple like memory mappings and then the action space will be show weapon wheel. So this is uh, one way you can do it in order to you know map better from the text to action space. I've tried it in past gen, the memory, it works quite well. Okay, they did not do it here in this paper. So if we are doing the method that they are doing in this paper, you need to name your functions very, very well, and also describe your functions very, very well. All right, so this is something that um, just need to take note. Okay, so let's go to, oh yeah, any comments about this before I move on? Okay, so I think this skill creation is actually a major source of uh, like downfall in this system because um, if you don't select the right skills, you will do the wrong stuff because whatever you do in action planning is purely based on the skills that you have curated. 
So over here, we show the weapon wheel. And great, we execute this task. So the show weapon wheel backend would be some Python code that does, it's a Python code that presses the tab key. All right, so we'll do some action that presses the tab key and then we will go to the next screen and then you can see the next screen after you press the tab key, the weapon wheel appeared. And again, you see the task here has changed. Use tab to select a weapon and release tab to equip. So you, you can see that this is the task inference right now. So before that, there's some reflection to say that, hey, um, yeah, I, I pressed the tap button to show weapon wheel. Weapon wheel has been shown. And, and now we need to do the next step. So, so that could be the reflection. Now time task inference is, this is the next task we need to do. And the skill curation, okay, we select the weapon at this XY coordinate. And this is basically the XY coordinate here. Again, for this XY coordinate, you need to use some bounding box to get the XY coordinate. So that's why you no know, stuff like grounding Dino is needed. Okay, if not, you won't be able to do this step. Okay, if you don't have the bounding box coordinate for your for your weapon, you won't be able to do this step. So this XY here will be done by the skill creation part. We'll define a new skill based on what has been seen on the screen. Okay, so based on this new skill, we will then do the action planning. We'll say, yes, I'll, I'll select this weapon at this box here. 0 0.6, 0 0.68, the X and Y coordinate. 0 0.6, 0 0.68. Okay, and they also have this thing to do reasoning before doing the action. So this is chain of thought planning, and it helps the LM output better actions. So we select the red box as it is currently ne near the, it is near the currently selected weapon. So... This is the box. This is the currently selected weapon. And, and oh, sorry, this is the currently selected weapon. And then we choose this purely because it's near. Okay. Because, okay, over here you see there's a vagueness, right? The game did not tell you what to choose. All right. <laughs> so the LM just say that, okay, I'll, I'll choose the nearest. Sure. I mean, that, that's, that's logical. All right. So that's what we do. We, we choose the nearest weapon. And you can see what's next. After choosing the weapon, all right? The reflection is that hey, nothing happens. <laughs> like you see, I'm I'm still I'm still hold hold tap to show the weapon wheel, right? That means the selected weapon is wrong. I need to change the weapon. All right. So this reflection is based on whether the screen change. All right. So this is like a key reason, a key way of how they like tell whether or not um the action is correct. So again, even if they don't uh know this, this actually tells you what to do next, right? So we already know that, yes, I need to hold tap to show the weapon wheel. So that, that is the task. So we basically curate the uh, skill. And over here, basically the skill is not this thing. The skill is actually show weapon wheel. Okay, there's a problem in the paper. It's, it's the skill creation is not the, the task itself. The skill curation is actually the skill name. Okay, so this is the retrieve skill. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll do this again. Again, once we get to this screen, all right, we have the new task inference here. And then what we'll do is the weapon in the green box is slightly more relevant to the target due to the last self-reflection. So you see, action planning, because it has the summary of what has happened so far, okay? And it also has the self-reflection. It's able to, you know, based on this selected weapon is wrong. And it knows that the past selected weapon is this thing here. So he knows that, okay, yes, I need to go with this weapon now. Okay, so you can see that memory is important. If you imbue memory in your system in the form of like self-reflection, in the form of summary of past actions, you are able to correct the different, the wrong actions in a limited time frame, of course, because uh, LMs have limited context and stuff. So if you have that thing in your history, in your, in your past memory, you are able to correct your actions and you can see over here, we select a weapon at a different place. And you see over here, I can't see that word, but I guess it's weight or something like that. Yep, or fire. I can't. So basically, the last reflector action was to select a weapon executed successfully. So you can see your self-reflection tells you whether or not the task is completed. So, you know, based on this self-reflection, you will then, you know, change the task. You know, if the task is completed, you change the task. And what's good about this game is that the next task will be here. You see, the game is very helpful. They'll tell you the next task right at the bottom here. So actually, what, what an AI system needs to do for this game, you just follow the instructions at the bottom. You should be able to play the tutorial levels already.
or at least go through most of it. Okay, so you can see over here the ammo count is six characters ready to fire. So GPT is able to also infer stuff like this from the, the image to tell you more context about what's going on. So I, I think this is quite cool because um from a very complex domain like image, it's able to infer the task. Okay, that alone is not easy, okay, because that task is not in some text box that you know you can just retrieve. You need to extract it from the image. So so that is difficult. And you know, when you extract it from the image, you notice that the background always changes. So you need to be able to do like OCR across various backgrounds. So that, that is a difficult thing to do. Okay, so once you have done this, you need to infer whether or not the previous task is complete. If you have tried wrong actions, you need a series of wrong actions so that you can use that to give yourself the right action next. So this stuff like this, you need memory and you cannot just store like the memory of everything because it's too long. You need to store memory that is like summarized and use this to, to do your action planning. So a lot of things needed to make this work, but overall this system uh, works with all the steps, like the self-reflection, task inference, skill curation, and action planning. Yep. Uh, questions on this, anyone? Yeah, uh, hey, um, Ajahn, um, so does this mean that for weapon wheels, if the guy is trying to open a door and the pistol is not the right tool, but it has a hammer, uh, but the hammer has never been used. Would this task solving procedure work for um tools that has has never been used? Yeah. So if let's say they select the tool and the tool is uh, not leading to a change in menu, all right, then the task inference uh, uh the self reflection and task inference will keep changing the weapon until you know the menu change. So if let's say this menu here doesn't like go to a new task at the bottom. Um, the LM might be stuck at that step <laughs> because like they keep trying. So this um reflection process relies a lot on the in-game queues at the bottom. So if your in-game queue did not like change, if let's say at the bottom is totally blank, then you know, I'm not too sure whether um it will infer like the weapon is a hammer and can knock down the door. You know, that that I'm not too sure whether it knows how to do that. You probably need to prompt it, you know, use the right hammer, use the right tool for the right situation and give some few short examples if let's say this thing is not here. But if you look at the prompt they use, it is quite uh, heavily based on whether the text at the bottom changes. So if you have done the action and the text at the bottom didn't change, the self-reflection will keep uh, prompting you to, to redo the step again. So it means that it will just keep trying and trying and rotating different tools if I don't have any additional uh, prompting or examples. Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. that's what I think it will do. I mean, I don't have access to this game. So um, just based on how they did the prompts, I can imagine the system to be like stuck in a loop. If let's say yeah. the text at the bottom doesn't change. It's like the, the in a sense, it demonstrates that the, the tutorial is really well written, right? Because it does what's in the tutorial. But yeah. if you had a hammer, it's not obvious necessarily, even to a player of the game, that the hammer is the tool to open a door. So even though it, it it might infer that it, the tools include a hammer and a gun and there's a door that needs to be opened, it may not go well, you know, then it falls back to how smart is your LLM? And, you know, we don't know they're not very clever, right? So it goes, try the handle. There is no handle because it's a computer game. Try the, you know, press on the, the button. Well, there isn't a button. It's not that kind of game either. So... It, you're down to you're left with with the LLM, right? Almost getting to the point where it's hallucinating in a useful manner. Yeah. So yeah. Um, mm -hmm. hopefully the LM will infer that you know if let's say if, if there's no task to guide, it will infer that hey you know the hammer is is related to the door so use that. Yeah. Uh, hopefully at the bottom there will be a task say enter the house or something so the LM is able to use like chain of thought reasoning to say I need to enter the house the door is locked. So I need to use something to unlock the door. So I need to check my tools. And then there's a hammer. So maybe I should use. So it, it requires quite a complex chain of reasoning. And um, that's also why I think they chose this game. Uh, because like this game is quite helpful. Yeah, LMs are not that great at like free open-ended reasoning. Like, if there's too many steps, chances are you will fail. Yeah. And I would say that for most games designed for humans, 
the reasoning steps aren't that much unless it's like go or chess like this kind of video games usually the the, the steps are quite related to our real life right if i give you a key i expect you to open the door you, you know what i mean i i don't expect anything else so that is uh i think a way to constrain the search space because if the games are designed in such a way that common items are used differently like a key maybe is used to you know fly we wouldn't think of that right like so so that is i mean some games are designed a, a, along that principle where you know it defies logic or defies convention but those games are very very hard you know you sometimes need guides for that but most games you see when i give you a weapon then the next step is to shoot right yeah so that is all based on real life stuff that helps you narrow down the search space already i think gpt is able to do that actually if you prompt it like say what is this item used for so maybe without the the text bar at the bottom if i give you the if you are able to deduce the items that are present you may be able to tell me like what's this item used for if i give you a broad task like enter the house and then i give you a hammer then you might infer that old oh, hammer is used to, to hit the door I, I think gpt can do that it's, it's just that in this game because you know this in-game guidance is quite strong so the prompts have evolved to utilize this in-game guidance way more than just using GPT-4 to like infer for its own. Yeah, uh, so Richard, I don't know if I answered your question or like, is it relevant to, to what you're thinking about? Yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll be moving on. And this, today's uh, session will be mainly focused on the reasoning and planning module. Because I think this is where LMs are lacking, right? LMs are great at um, pattern matching. You know, if you want to do like um, a description match to a, a skill function, I think LMs can do that pretty well. Like a free flow text match to like a desired function output. You can do that pretty well. Like function calling in GPT-4, it's about 80% accuracy on, 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 on the major benchmarks. So that it's, uh, it means that it's above chance level and, LMs are able to deduce. But for reasoning and planning, this is difficult because to plan, you need to sort of understand like what your actions would do in the immediate next step and and so on. That uh, in reinforcement learning, you know, even doing that is difficult. People have tried all sorts of ways like creating world models to model the world, but these world models take very long to learn. Uh, I, in my paper, I, I use memory to do modeling but this memory is also limited because like you can only store a certain instance like you if the instance change maybe you cannot retrieve correctly so lms okay <laughs> internally have no world model all right they definitely also don't have internal memory to store new instances you need to imbue the lm with the memory module and then you need to use the memory module to you know try to relate it to your current tasks and see whether is it relevant or not so to do this well is uh, an art okay is is okay it's a bit of a science but right now it's a bit of an art also because no one really knows how to get it to do it well so let us analyze how this paper does the reasoning and planning module where are the drawbacks and how can we improve it so um, this is basically the summary for what the paper did <laughs> reflect on the past summarize the plan present and plan for the future so um, essentially, this is a self-reflection. Um, summarize the, the present is the summary for action planning. And then plan for the future is action planning. So um, again, you can see this is how it's done. Um, self-reflection is from eight image frames. Okay, deduce whether last execution uh, executed action was carried out. Okay, if the task failed, provide analysis for the failure. So this is important because, you know, if let's say um, we choose the wrong weapon or something like what you saw earlier, this analysis can actually help, okay, when you actually do the next task inference. You can actually use it, what you have analyzed to, to tell you what task to do next, okay? But this is also a source of failure, okay? Self-analysis can be a source of failure. Yeah, anyone want to guess why? <laughs> why why do you think like using GPT to like to 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 critique itself can be a source of failure? Okay. 
So actually the, the main thing here is because uh, if GPT-4 is not able to do it, or is not able to do the task, uh, it may not generate the right constructive steps. Yeah, so this is heavily reliant on the abilities of GPT-4 to actually do the task. If your task is so far away from the convention of what GPT-4 is used to in the training set, it might actually do something different. Like if let's say a key is used to unlock a door, by this game, the key is used to fly. Okay, it's very unlikely that GPT will say, hey, you know, you should use the key to fly. Yeah, that 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 is not going to happen. Not, not so easily. So this part may fail, but for most games, I think that's not a problem because most games match reality. Uh, at least most games I've, I've played, all right? So um, this self-reflection is important. After that, um, based on the game menu, you try to infer what's the task right now, okay? And then after that, we curate the task, uh, curate the skills needed for the task from the procedural memory, which is the list of uh, Python code. And then we finally choose the actions from the curated skill set. Okay, and put in the, a list of actions. So all, all this uh, very cool stuff, I, I think this uh, whole thing is quite similar to, to Ghost in the Minecraft. Okay, which is basically like also uh, from observations to list of steps. So you execute each step in a modular way. And I think that that works for this game because like this game, the actions are rarely concurrent. It's always one action at a time. So this, this way of uh, doing the action planning is fine. So task inference, how? Uh, so before that, I actually want to talk more about self-reflection, which is basically, um, it just tells uh, itself whether it can solve the, whether the task has been solved. So um, this one here is, uh, is key, but it can fail as what I mentioned earlier. So moving on, task inference. So GPT-4 can also tell itself like what's the task it should do. So we let it propose what task it should perform Okay, when it believes it's time to start a new task. And you know, most of the time, this is queued by the game menu. Right? Once it has generated the task, it follows the task for a maximum of H iterations. So there, there's this limit that they put inside. Okay, before going back to the next, the last long horizon task in the stack. So for example, if my task is long horizon task is go to the town. Okay, then the short horizon is lead the horse. So after I do for H iterations, I will go back to the go to the town step. And this is uh, possible because, you know, the game gives you both the long and short horizon tasks. Uh, long horizon task usually is like the top, top left corner. They have like some mission that you want to do. The short horizon is at the bottom, you know, what you should do now. So um, that is the kind of thing that is happening here. And I think for this game, this uh, kind of works because like most of the time you just follow the short horizon task, you will get the, the whole product done, right? So actually if you ask me, right, the game is doing planning for you <laughs> because the game already tells you what's the short horizon task. So in the prompt you see for task inference, um, they ask GPT to infer the task from the screen and also infer whether it is long or short horizon, right? And basically, after it's infer all this, then it decides whether or not to go to the task. So uh, whether or not to go to the task, whether or not to change tasks is a binary outcome. So you can treat, or, treat it like a Boolean, like should I change tasks, true or false? Yeah, so this, they found that it works better than just asking GPT to, you know, list out the next task. Yeah, so this is something that to, to highlight. I also found this to be the case in task gen. Like if you ask GPT to free flow generate text, sometimes it may not um, do what you want it to do. So if you already give it like, okay, this is the task. Should I do this task? Yes or no? Yeah, that, that actually gives better outcomes sometimes. Okay. So um, they mentioned in the paper that this is more efficient than replanning at every iteration because after doing the short horizon task, you immediately go back to the long horizon task. All right, so this, uh, in my opinion, is uh, like a bit of a hack, <laughs> a bit of a bypass because like the game is doing the planning for you. But you know, if you really, really want to do this kind of long-term planning, if let's say this is your main task, you should actually start with the main task and then you split into subtasks here to, to do the subtasks one by one. 
and then each subtask will be executed by like maybe different uh, modules and so on. That is similar to like what is done in the task gen framework with hierarchical agents. You have a list of tasks, you split into smaller tasks, and then you do each task first. Okay. The reason why I think they didn't do this is because um, in the game, it is very guided. Yeah, if it's more free flow, then this method will work better. But if you are know, using the tutorial levels, like what this paper is doing, then maybe you just need to follow what the tutorial is telling you. Then this method will work well. Yeah. I think I think it's worth that this in the game, the because this is the tutorial level, right? So there's the structure of I play embarrassing amount of computer games, but the 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 structure is this is the, the tutorial. It's all about immediate tasks, things to do right this second. And so you learn how to do them. Like it is explicitly about building skills. And then later in the game, it comes back to very little or no guidance at all about what you should be doing. And yeah. it's up to you to figure out where to go in this large open world game. Right? So I, I think you're, uh, eventually it turns into these very long horizon tasks, you say, like hours, days later, in terms of real time, if not game time. Um, the, and so I think this idea, I mean, this, this task planning, I think is really just a proof of concept what I've done here in my mind. And this is not intended to solve, um, Red Dead Redemption. It's just, uh, uh, here's what you can do. Here's a proof that we can do these in the game. And that's how I, re that's how I read it anyway. Um, yeah. no. I think it's a good first step because at least it can solve the tutorial levels. I mean, I think yeah. doing the tutorial levels is, is a difficult task by itself because that, that requires interpretation of the game. It really, like, that. so I'm not trying to take anything away from them. It, like, they've done a, like, it works. Like, it does what it says on the tin. Um, and there's no particular, there's nothing in particular they've done here except depend on a particularly well-made game, right? They've, which has a really good tutorial. It tells you exactly what you need to do. And you, it is, does, help you the player learn skills in the game that's the, that's the goal of the, the tutorial levels other games there's nothing you know like <laughs> if, if you tried if you tried to apply apply this to chess for instance it just wouldn't help you like, there's no there's nothing to interpret there's no text there's no nothing the, that's that's not part of the general how do you play chess everyone's assumed that to generally more or less no right um and so maybe you you try a tutorial level for chess at some point, but I can't imagine there would be that many takers. Um, so it may not work terribly well. And um, so no, I think it's really, I mean, for me, it's really interesting. I look at this as a, as, uh, so they've just killed grinding in computer games. Grinding is this thing of where you do the same repetitive task over and over again for in-game outcomes of some sort. But that's exactly the sort of thing this would be great for automating. And there are already bots to automate that sort of thing. They're all outlawed, but not unknown by any means. Um, so uh, like, it could be, in its own way, quite influential in game design. Um, that it's Cradle and the AI that goes with it to a lesser extent. Because it's demonstrating we the, the player strictly speaking, doesn't have to play through the boring bits. Right? And so, and also in, in more generally into RPA tasks as well, I think. So we'll see how that goes. I, I sort of look at this really as a proof of concept as a RPA, sort of robotic, pro, pro, robotic process automation, the uh, acronym I'm annoyingly familiar with, but um, <laughs> it's, um, it, I'm not sure how, how common it is elsewhere, but it, it means essentially doing what Cradle's doing here. Right, where you run the joystick, the the mouse, the keyboard, the what have you, in order to get an outcome in it, some third party application. Mm. And so, and this is a really the lack of prior knowledge that this has been built with. It says follow the the instructions. Well, you could pretty easily put the instructions in a word document to one side, right, and then you could have this running a I don't know, insurance claims system, right? If you yeah. say, do step one, do step two, do step three, because that's what the instruction manual says the people need to do. 
there's no particular reason why it has to be um, Red Dead Redemption. It could be almost any app is really the the the, the way they've set this up. It's really it's an elegant proof for me in that regard. Mm. So um, what you said is is correct. Like um, you should be able to learn and infer like any skills and any skill that is related to mouse or or keyboard presses because uh, the the problems to do that. So that that works well for like a general setting. Or if you have documentation to like tell it what to do, you could tribute those skills. So um, indeed, like okay, I think we can go on to the skill part. I think the skill part they have done it quite well. I I quite like the skill part. It's just that I mean the uh, the thing that I'm talking about here about the task thing, I don't think this LM is able to do long term planning. So this is why probably they only chose the tutorial levels because it works quite well. Later you see they also have an open ended level where you know you need to buy stuff from the shop, and it doesn't work very well. So um that that is a limitation of the large language model and something that we need to discuss to decide like you know how to solve it because. If you are talking about a uh, generally autonomous agent to do stuff, I don't think we are there yet with current GPT technology or LM technology. Like, what it can do is it can probably infer what the short-term instruction is to them and carry it out. So that, that's more or less what it can do. Long-term stuff, not really. So uh, for RPA, robotic process automation, if everything is short-term, I think LMs can do the job. <laughs> it can, can match at least the user intent to uh, a, a set of actions. So uh, that that is the proof of concept that they showed here. Yeah. So I I do agree with uh most parts of what you say. Uh, there's also one thing that you say about chess versus like games, right? Like so this is another thing that I like to talk about in another session. This is about optimality versus uh, pattern matching. Like, okay, not really games, like maybe real life. Yeah. So that that is uh, one reason why like chess has been touted as one of the hardest games because you can't really use like how you do pattern matching like. To say so normally better matching is like I I'm here in this room, I want to go to the door. So I can match, you know, like, oh, I've previously done like this this memory of mine. I've gone to the door here before. I match to that memory, I know what to do. But chess, you know, if given the starting position, it's like I want to win. But how can I win? There's so many possibilities, and it's very, very rigid in the sense that if you do something wrongly, that's it. You need to do a perfect series of moves. So chess, uh or like go like it's a game that doesn't re uh that that penalizes heavily on missteps, and that is why I think humans don't do it that well because when we do approximate pattern matching we make make mistakes but we correct our mistakes because of self inference like self reflection and so on so these are two very different kinds of intelligence I feel like one is uh totally like you really need to optimize and that is what is uh done pretty well in AI right now, but the other kind is more of like very vague, very fuzzy kind of matching. And that is, I mean, done like by LMs, but we don't really see it uh, in most real life robots because you know, we have been very, very uh, steeped in this optimality realm. Yeah, I mean, we can discuss more about this. I, I think this is a, an interesting discussion about like, what are the like, optimal, op is optimality the only kind of intelligence or like pattern matching? Is pattern matching an intelligence, uh, a form of intelligence? I would say both are, are needed, actually. <laughs> we are actually better at the pattern matching one. We are not very good at optimality. Yeah, you, you ask most humans to, you know, see whether or not, like, you can win the game of chess perfectly. We can't do it. Yeah. So that is the, that's not the building mechanism in our brains. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other comments before I move on to the skill part? All right, let's go. So for skills, okay, so given that this is a general computer setting, they actually have categorized broadly four kinds of skills that are needed. So the first kind is that you need to hold a key, uh, press a key down for maybe one second or two seconds. So this press duration is important because like some in-game actions <laughs> require you to, to press longer to take effect. So you need to like maybe lead the uh lead the horse for two seconds, you know, that kind of thing. You press early, the horse will stop. Yeah. So there's also a hole. So it like this hole means key is already pressed down. Yeah. So you continue hold. So that that maybe in some interactions. I'm not too sure what interactions, but I can imagine like stuff like you know, open cabinet or something, you might need to hold the button a bit. Yeah. 
So there's also release key, which is like to let go of the key. And finally, we have a mouse mouse movement. I think it might be for things where you do like shift one or, or alt one or something like that. So you're doing a key combination. You'd need the hold, release, and press in the right sequence. Yeah, probably. So there's one thing over here that I'm not too sure. Like over here is this pointer move, but there's no pointer press because like I, I suppose maybe after they move there, they click because you kind of need to click, right? You cannot just move there. So these are the four base uh, actions that uh, is used to build every single possible action in the game. Or if you think of it in a broader setting, it's also used to build anything for like navigating a web page to, you know, uh, doing another game, I guess. Like, as long as the game uses a computer, it more or less captures most of the things. Uh, okay, there's things like, you know, select a bounding bo a box by mouse, you know, like, because you still need to have mouse press, mouse release, you know, st stuff like this. I, I don't think this is really done in the game right now. So this is uh, stuff that I think is specific for Red Dead Red Redemption. But if you are to do it for more generic settings, you probably need to have the mouse press, mouse mouse drag. Yeah. I, I'll just add in a few more actions. Like I, I think all these actions are not really there. But it also means that for Red Dead Redemption, you don't need to like do a, a box selection. Like if you are playing games like StarCraft, you might need to select uh, a, a whole range of units, right? So you need to have this mouse actions as well. Right now, we only have one action. Okay, I, I might be wrong here, but at least this is my understanding of the action space. For the keys-wise, I think it's fine. You know, like when you do the pressing of the keys, you can also press multiple keys at the same time by making the key like that. So if, if you if you specify your key is like that, that means you press B and J at the same time. Yeah, so this is already catered for in the action space. The mouse movement it looks like it's just going there and then like clicking once. At least this is what I understand of it. So uh, if we want to do it for more generic settings, we have to buff up the action space a bit for the mouse. But I think for the key wise, looks okay. All right. I mean, maybe there's one action space that, you know, you want to do like, like, like a string. <laughs> like, because uh, if you just base only on this, you might need to composite like every single word you need to keep pressing this one by one. You know, if you have a type function, like you want to type in a UI element, uh, this might be useful for doing web search, um, navigation in Google Maps and so on. So based on your application, we might need to buff up this action space a bit, but at least this is the base price for a general computer interface that can do like key presses and mouse movements. Okay, so uh, let's... Okay, so... Uh... Okay, it looks like they have other things, you see, like mouse hole, right button. So these are the key broad skills over here. But it looks like they also uh, implemented a bit more for the game, like left click, right click. So again, as I said, like these skills will be needed based on what you need to do, what the user needs to do for the interface. So we need to have more of these base skills. Okay, so given the in-game description, how does Cradle map it to the program? How does it map to a Python program that can do it? So behind the scenes, of course, you know, uh, this will be mapped to some instruction, like key press will be mapped to some instruction to, to, to press the keyboard. Yeah. So um, this one, I think is easily done. You could have a wrapper to just wrap it directly to your, your, your input devices, no problem. So the key thing is, how do we translate something like this? Go to the shed and then press Q to take cover into this. So uh, this is done. If you look at the prompts, this is done using few short prompting. So they give some examples of like instructions and then like how to map to this code. Okay, they also give the, uh, also give the prior skills so that it's able to, you know, use the prior skills to mix and match. So like, for example, here, you can see these prior skills are very broad. Press key, hold key. So what they will do is they will just replace this key with like the key that's needed or press Q and so on. So this, how how this key is mapped is by a few short prompting. So if I give you a few examples of how the in-game text match to the program, and granted this game, the instructions are kind of standard i mean like it looks looks uh the similar kind of format so you give a few short prompts of a few different types it should be able to map quite well 
to the skills. And indeed, that's what we see. So the game failure is very little to do with mapping of new skills. In fact, this skill learning is like top notch. Okay, learns the skills very accurately. So this you can see uh is the beauty of large language models. Like you don't even need to do model fine tuning. You just need to give a few short examples of like how to do you know, certain prompts, like from mapping from this, go to chat, then press Q to click cover into this program. You just need a few examples and well, yeah, everything works. Okay. So uh, this is quite cool because uh, imagine you have a new task, like, uh, I don't know if, if you design like a tutorial level for teaching someone to use the web to do Google search or what, like you can say, hey, uh, type in this search bar, type this word in the search bar. And you know, from that prompt, you could maybe learn Hey, I could learn a type skill, you know, that kind of thing. So if you design your tutorial level well, you know, you are able to do this. Uh, or you could already build it in built into one of your your your, your pre-baked skills. So there are different ways to do this. Uh I think this part here is is done quite well already. All right. It's able to map from the in-game description into the skills itself. So this is the key question I have. Uh, what if the game doesn't tell you what to do, all right? So there are some times, you know, uh, you need to figure out like, hey, uh, I need to go to this treasure chest and press the open button. But the game doesn't tell you press the open button when you are next to the treasure chest. Like, So, uh, okay, this won't uh, affect the learning of the skill because I would suppose at the previous stage, the game already teach you how to, taught you how to open but how to map this action to some other object that the game did not teach you? I think that is uh, not obvious, all right? So uh, for humans, like, I mean, you, 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 I teach you how to do this open button. And then what you'll do is you will just go around the world and you interact and then see whether you can open. Or like most games, you press the X to talk, right? Or interact. Even if I don't tell you, you can open the cupboard, you can press X and then cupboard open. Then I know, oh, I need to open. Okay, but if the game doesn't tell you how to do it, I don't think GPT will do it. So uh, again, this is a limitation of the large language model. And it could be solved if we give it more context about, hey, uh, you need to go around the world, explore, see what works, what doesn't work. If you give it more prompts like that, it can shift the behavior in that direction. So I think this is solvable. Okay, but it's quite amazing, right? I don't, don't you think it's quite amazing? Like given this, this text, you can map to this program quite well. I think this is... Uh, it's quite amazing. All right. Uh, there's also other things in the like the fine print is like make sure that no duplicate skill name. Okay. So uh, this is important because you you want to reference only one unique skill. Okay. And also they do some checks to execute the code, make sure the code can run. So I think this these are additional things that uh, you need to take note. Action planning. Okay. I think this is the main part here, and I think this is the part that. LMs don't do well. So let me just highlight, okay? LMs don't do well for this. Okay. Anyone want to like give a reason, you know, like why, why? Okay, who here agrees that LMs cannot plan actions well? Anyone? Okay, who here thinks LMs can plan actions well? You can raise your hand or you can just comment. It'd be better be a pretty easy problem, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for easy problems like uh, very straightforward mapping, like for example, press W, press W to you know, like for for example, this this thing here. If your if your task is just like press Q to take cover like that, LMs can plan it well because LMs can you can say give me break this down into two steps, so they are able to break down this into or break this down into a list of steps. They are able to do this quite well. Okay, the problem comes if let's say you know the task is like height. So you see a task like this height from enemy, right? Like there's no obvious mapping to hey, I need to go to the shed and then I need to take cover. So you kind of need to infer like, hey, uh to hide from enemy, I need to find shelter. In front of me, the nearest shelter is the shed. Now I need to go to the shed and before I can hide in the shed, I need to press Q. So you need to do a longer chain of inference. And I think that is what LMs are weak at. Okay, so action planning is only good. Let me highlight this, okay? It's only good 
if your task is directly linked to your action space. Okay, if your task is very vague, right? Like for example, if your task is with game of chess. <laughs> Richard, you said that example just now, right? How how to map this to your action space? It's very hard. So uh that is not the forte of large language models. But if your task is something very, very similar to your action space, like go to shed and press Q to take cover, you know? Yeah, I think LMs can do that. So again, use the LMs for the right stuff, for the right stuff. Okay, so how do we do this action planning? We basically take in the top K relevant skills. Okay. So uh, this is known uh, using retrieval augmented generation. Basically, uh, it takes the cosine similarity of the task name and compared to skill name plus description. And guess what? Uh, this is the same thing as what uh, I did in task gen. So it's exactly the same for this. So um, this, I think, works pretty well already for most cases. Okay. And, uh, yeah, this is basically curating your context so that you only plan with a subset of your skills. And I would like to emphasize that this is very important. Curating the list of skills is very important. Okay, because I've tried like in my uh, abstraction and reasoning corpus, I gave it all the skills and guess what? LMs hallucinate. it. They map. Like for example, if you give it a skill of called rotate the grid for the abstraction and reasoning corpus, in this case, what you want to do is you want to change the color of a square from yellow to green. It might end up rotating the grid <laughs> for no reason. So if your skills that you give it or you give context and uh, that context is not exactly relevant, you know, sometimes the LMs might just match to that. Right? And that is uh, not what we want. So if you create the list of skills, you make the list of skills uh, very, very concise. So the problem will be like that. Uh, the list of skills here, a task, a set of retrieve skills, uh, this is a smaller set. If you give a smaller set, okay, the chance of hallucination is lower. Chance of hallucination is lower with a smaller set of skills. And I think that's very important. So like, when you use the LM systems to do problem solving and so on, don't expose it to all, all the skills if, as far as possible. Okay, try to curate it according to your task. So I call this task dependent skill selection. I think this is very important and I'm happy they did it. And the very, very important thing we were talking about earlier, summary of task context. Okay, summary is important again because we don't want to overload the LM. And then of course there's other information of like maybe what are the, the menu items and so on, the screen information. Yeah, so action planning is done with a very targeted prompt. Okay, it's a very task driven action planning. And what we want to do is we want to come up with a list of skills. Okay, a list of skills to do. Okay, but before that, we ask it to explain what it wants to do. Then give the list of skills. Yeah, again, I open to the floor. Like, why do you think before it comes out the list of skills, why do you think the authors prompted to explain? Anyone want to, 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 to try to guess? Like, why, why do you think this is this is that? Um, that's just a chain oh. of thought reasoning kind of approach, right? It's it it has been found to give a better outcome bluntly. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is uh again a perk, a quote of the large language model is that whatever you generate will be used by the later part. So let's say for example, if your prompt is of this format, or prompt is of the format tasks, skills. Summary of context and then like uh explanation of what to do. Or I mean in this case, it could be like thoughts, and then you can have your action here. So what happens is that if you have your prompt in this format, whatever that you typed earlier, or whatever there's output earlier, like including the explanation here, would be used to generate your actions, which makes it more uh targeted. So if you do away with the explanation step. You know, just this tree alone, you know, may not give you the right semantic structure to give your action directly. But by putting a thoughts or explanation there, you might be able to, to guide the language model to, you know, because of this explanation here that is more targeted to like how to solve the task, it, it's better able to map it to the skills that is given here. 
to to solve the task. So this is something that uh, I also did like quite often to try to map the thinking or try to provide a, an avenue for the LM to to do some thinking. If if possible, it would be great if you could guide the thinking yourself. So if you can guide the thinking yourself, like basically give it known uh uh things to look out for. Like for example, in the prompt that they use, they say that oh, if the menu is open, you know, look for relevant things in the menu. If the if the mini map is present, look for cues in the uh, so, so some something like that. If you could guide this thinking, it will make your plan action much better. Especially if what you guide it is related to what you want it to do. So so like for example, for math, like let's say Mary has five apples, John has five apples or four apples. Mary gave John two apples. How many apples does John have? So this this is a kind of math question that the you know, LMs are not that great to solve. Okay. And what you can do is you can say like uh, you can prompt it like what is the action done? What is the okay, like the prompt is like what is the initial apples? For each person, what is action done? What is the resultant action apples for each person? So if you can prompt it in something like that, if you already know the task and you know that it's a transfer or like that, you know, or this will actually help the large language model to think step by step. So if you already know what your task needs to do, you could prompt it specifically for your task. If not, the let's think step by step, which is the original chain of thought paper. Uh, this is something that is uh that is useful also, but this is very big and generic. Though uh, deep mind come up with a better one. <laughs> you, you know the problem. Take a deep breath <laughs> and take step by step. So, so so stuff like this uh can help the model generate better responses, and they also use this for this paper. All right. So this is the action planning part. Questions. All right. So I I guess this is clear. So next we have memory. I think this memory is a uh, quite important, as I said, in order to do like reflection across temporal instances, you kind of need to maintain your past experiences so you can use it to make decisions later. Uh, like for example, if you don't have this memory, you wouldn't know that you selected the wrong weapon in the weapon wheel, you can't correct your action later on. So uh, how is this episodic memory done? Uh, it's the most recent video frames, the images, the five images, and then basically uh, we, we basically take in the uh, text and visual information from the images, what actions that we do, what tasks we infer, what's the reasoning for the task. All, all this will go into one key module to summarize. Okay, And basically, this summarization will be used for Action Planner. And again, as I said just now, the summarization module uh, takes into account the previous summary as well, plus all this new information. And then it consolidates a new summary. So it's a recurrent process. Your summary maintains about the same length, but you keep updating with the recent information. So I think this is a very cool concept about uh, how to maintain state. Uh, as I also said, like you cannot maintain too long a state because if you fix your summary window to be this length, you will lose information if you take if you, if you go across a, a too long a time instance. So you kind of need to you know have different summary for only like a short time period so that you don't overload your summary. Yeah, but I think this is a cool idea. Uh, next, we have procedure mem procedural memory, which is basically your Python code for your mouse and keyboard presses. And I think this is also a very nice idea to like learn tasks from the environment if the environment teaches you how to do it. <laughs> if the environment doesn't teach you how to do it, then this method uh, doesn't work too well. But if you look at the cradle prompts, okay, at first I was very impressed with this method. Uh, but if you look at the cradle prompts, most of the skills that are needed, right, are actually predefined. Like, uh, you look here, you have turn, move forward, shoot, select item, follow, navigate path, fight. Okay, so this last few things here, these are composite actions that, that go over long horizons. Okay, and I suspect it's because you know navigation is something hard for large language models. And you know, if you have 
a predetermined way to navigate, you code it in, it's much better to just do pattern matching to those functions. Fighting, okay, if you let the LM decide how to fight, it may not press the buttons consecutively enough, okay, to, to get the action done. Because sometimes you need to press the, the action, you need to match the button very fast consecutively. So these are the kind of things that I think there's some issues with this system learning, okay, and that is predefined already. So other stuff like how to shoot is also predefined, okay, which is basically a coordination of the mouse button there and then pressing uh, the shoot button. So that is already predefined, uh, turning, move forward, all this. So I would say that the agent itself is not a clean slate. It comes in built with actions already that are relevant to this game. And I believe this is how like most systems should operate because learning the skill from the environment interaction itself can be very difficult. Like you, 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 you may not have a very clean skill to work with. So if if you have all these predefined skills that are needed for your environment, like you really know what you need for your environment, you can just predefine all of them. You don't really need to learn from the environment itself. Right? So this is exactly what I done in last year. Everything is predefined. You you do very little learning. Uh I think this learning, while useful, uh doesn't really hold well for most real world context because in most real world situations you don't have a text box at the bottom saying press Q to to hide you know you don't have that so most of the time like how we walk how we run is all like predefined I mean we might have learned it in the past but you know you can treat it as a predefined skill after you have learned it I don't know uh your your comments on this piece like do you think like the AGI systems you know we should predefine these skills or we should let them learn it well, I think one of the so for mine, right, this is a computer game. It's an application that's been designed to be easily learnable. So in addition to, and also it's a in a genre, right? So there's a bunch of of pre-existing information that a player has that the and the LLM has its own pre-existing knowledge, right? It's been trained on. So from its corpus or whatever it's that's worked on. So there's nothing. It's not a, a you know, pure blank slate. It never would be or could be. And I think the, the challenge here is that um, to, you could, I, I hadn't gone through to the point where you're saying with these high-level um, long-horizon tasks, right? The, those it needs to figure out, right? And it, it, in my mind, so as, a, as a sort of AGI-style approach, this is deeply flawed because of it. Right? <laughs> now, now the 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 as a, I still think as a demonstration of Cradle, it's it's awesome, right? Cradle is is a really good thing. It's RPA with, and in, in a more in a very general way, self learning RPA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like <laughs> it's, <the> level, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's that's great, and in principle, this can like, this can be built upon to do more and more and more, which is great. But it's not it's not going to take us down the road of AGI. And I don't think it's intended to be to be give, given their due. Right? Um well they want the, to make AGI though. Yeah, this is well, a Yeah, down. but the, not not this week. Right? So <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that there's um like it's really interesting. So they are doing a it is a learning system demonstrably. It is not an ideal learning system, but it does learn. It has pre-existing knowledge and skills, but kind of that's the nature of how LLMs are anyway. Right? It, there's a good chance that this LLM, whatever they've used, GP, um, GPT-3 or 4 or I, any of them, actually already has a very good knowledge of the game. The game's not new. right? It's certainly within the, the, the horizon that it could know about. Um, so it's probably read a couple of thousand articles on the computer game already. Um, Arthur yeah. Morgan is not a new character for GPT-3. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's going to be, it has probably somewhere got stashed away a whole bunch of walkthroughs for the missions as well. Right? There, there's, so th this is not a, there's no clean room implementation here. Um, and I think the, what's interesting though is how, uh, is it, it's to come back to that RPA idea I was sort of toying with earlier, right? Yeah. If you give it a Word document with instructions for a person, can it follow the instructions? Like the manual for Red Dead Redemption is about 
four pages total. It's really very, very small. Um, and it doesn't have a lot of content, even for that. It's a lot of pictures. So the 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 yeah. yeah. One of the reasons is limited. It has to be limited, is because it has a limited understand experience of the world, which is only the game, right? Except for the LLM, which has this huge, vast reading knowledge behind it. So I say there's no clean room, but it is. It's clever what they've done. Like you, I wish they'd done a bit more or different, but they've there, there's no there's no perfect solution coming out of this, right? I think as a as a first step, this is already very good. I mean, the fact that it can play a video game is uh, amazing. <laughs> it's just that um, if we were to use this for uh, like learning general tasks, there will be some problems because uh, there's actually a little uh, too over reliant. Or I mean, it's a little too over reliant on the in game prompts. And I'm not too sure whether, you know, if you give it like free flow exploration, whether it can do it. So I think actually the problem here is a problem of uh, exploration because you need to you need to learn like what actions are good, what are bad, you know, like what sequence of actions leads to outcomes. So all these things are issues that. The system has because it has limited opportunity to do this exploration is normally just doing whatever the LM sets for the action space. You know, in reinforcement learning, there's this thing of uh, explore versus exploit, right? Uh, the cradle system is uh, exploit. Yeah, so everything is just exploit, exploit, exploit. I feel like if it cannot work, then we self reflect and then choose another action. So um, this method here uh, may not explore the environment like fully, and also we shouldn't explore the environment fully because there's just too many things to explore, too too many uh, state spaces to go to. I think this uh is not a problem with Cradle. This is probably an issue with only one agent. Okay, all this exploration can be done with multiple agents. So if you have each agent configured with different biases, you know, we might already explore the space and then if you share information between agents, you might have a really good system, like even just using Cradle as a backbone, one agent in Cradle, but you initialize them differently. Maybe one likes to walk a lot, a lot, one likes to interact with people a lot, one likes to, you know, fight a lot. Then each can get different experience and they can share with each other what are the sprite sequences of actions for different things. I think this might work. Yeah, it's just... Uh, Maybe not just one agent. So, yeah, uh, I I I quite like the the way that they did the prompt engineering and so on for this. Um, it's just that you know I have my doubts about whether this was scale to generic tasks, and I also have some doubts about whether or not a generic or AGI kind of generic AI is possible, because I, it's just too much things that the AGI system needs to know. Uh, all this like core priors. If your priors change, you know, it's very hard to learn those priors. So maybe we could have a very general system, but grounded in some priors, like keyboard presses, maybe like a general system to do keyboard presses. Like you wouldn't expect a general system that can do anything. Yeah. So I think once we get uh, the AGI definition sorted out to be like a general agent within some bounds, uh, then this creator system might be the system for that. And you add in more of such creator agents, you know, you, you might get uh, the problem exploration solved. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Any other comments before I move on? Yeah, I, I think Richard like brought up a good point, you know, whether it's like you know GPT three, four, five, or six. Um this game is all, right? So there's probably okay, something sorry, really, really, I shouldn't do quite, quite more. Oh uh, okay, I guess all means like a few years, yeah. <laughs> but it's one of the more recent games. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, please continue, yeah. No, I I was saying that like you know I'm I'm wondering if they had chosen another game what would happen, like you know a new game that probably like you know GDP four does not have the information or the background that they have captured. <laughs> uh, actually, I think this game even on the web, like I'm not too sure whether you could just use the text on the web to help you play the game because the the game is more of a interactive. You know, it's in the environment itself. It can be hard to you know learn how to play it just from text alone. You might need some video understanding as well. 
So, yeah, I mean, as a player, that happens, right? I I did play through the whole game when a couple of years ago. Oh, and, you played it again? How, oh, it? yeah. I, oh, it was a great game. Totally an awesome game. But the, the, the um, it, it's, um, the, so when it, so the, the principal character's character, Arthur Morgan, right? Later, you introduce to other supporting characters. And I think, Kai, to your point, that, that's going to be where it, sort of comes out where it goes oh i know so and so is the bad guy right just because of their name and it's <laughs> yeah. read, 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 and and gpt three or four out of us read a thousand articles that say this is the bad guy this is where you find him this is what to do next right um but at the moment when at this level in the tutorial it's really super fine grain it's pick this up push that knock that over so there's not a lot of context required or even offered it's it's a very limited um, context for the game and the for, and the, the player to work with. Um, later in the game, it becomes extremely open. Right, you you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, go and find so and so. You know, I have no idea where they are. Well, I will have to go and figure that out then. Right. Yeah. So um, the 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 sort of problems become you know very strategic, and real planning is required before you try and do some things. Otherwise, you will fail. Um, and in the game, that happens a lot. To teach the player, you need to plan things. Right? So um, the I think at the moment, what they've demonstrated is it can follow the instructions on screen to a useful outcome eventually, which is good. The In terms of can it... Could it play the whole game to its end? No. There's absolutely no way this could do it. But... Um, the, the 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 like it's just not good enough at shooting like it, it's terrible so um uh, thing problem and it's too slow and so on and so forth so the game will require you to move quickly and do things quickly in the few, later in the game and it will not it won't be able to keep up with the game later which is fine um but at this level it's all about detail detail detail, detail. and so there's not much context there's no characters there's no story yet or not much at any rate in the first yeah, two chapters. Some story, I mean, like some dialogue, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but there's there's not much to deal with. Um, later, where there's where it's dialogue driven, um, problem solving, that's a different matter. Yeah, you know, what's the correct thing for Arthur to say in this circumstance? Yeah, right. it'll be interesting. Yeah. I mean, if we can solve the rate date reduction too fully, then I would say that our planning abilities have risen to a level that I think is good enough for AGI. Yeah, right now the planning. As I said, our apps don't really plan very well. So we haven't solved this problem for planning yet. So I, later, I'll have a few slides on talking about planning. So I guess I should move on because there's still a few more slides to cover. So uh, yeah, why is Red Dead Redemption so hard? So you can see this is the difficulty of how the our apps, the Cradle system solve it. Follow that, hitch horse, go to shed, all this, all easy. Uh, I suppose it's because there's some bullets at the bottom to tell you what to do. Ah, choose weapon to prepare for combat. Hard, all right. Hard because the game instruction just tells you to choose weapon, right? They never tell you what weapon to choose. So that that requires like self-reflection. Sometimes self-reflection doesn't get you the right weapon and so on. Protect Dutch. So you need to shoot the enemy. Shooting is hard. Search for supplies in the house. It's hard because they don't tell you where the supply is in the house. So you can see these are the kind of tasks that are not straightforward. No text. It does pick up equipment. Find up gun and pick up gun and head loss. So you also need to go to the head. You need to go to the gun. They don't tell you, hey, um, the gun is here. The head is here. I mean, if I saw a uh, gameplay of Red Dead Redemption 2 before, like, these are, like, they'll just tell you, pick up the equipment, but they never tell you where the equipment is. You need to go and walk around and find it. Yeah, so these are tough for GPD. So uh, you really need to infer what's around the world, you know, and, and, and go and do it. So, like, other stuff, like, look for John, you know, you need to you go through some very specific stuff, uh, shoot wolves. You can see all the stuff involving shooting, right? It's hard, right? Like, right horse and protect from wolves also involves some shooting, I guess. Yeah. So this is a kind of thing that you know, if they don't tell you, hey, shoot this wolf, hey, shoot this, uh, uh, pick up this head at this position. If it's not that targeted, and GPT needs to kind of infer what to do, like an open-ended task, it's hard. Okay. Real-time interactions needed is hard. These are some issues with latency of the game. So, let's take a look at what are the kind of things that it does well and what it doesn't do well. So with, okay, 
with the native cradle, it does most of the stuff well, like go to shed pretty pretty well, like it lead horse, equip shotgun, all this. It does very, very well. And you can see that it does well with reflection. Without the self-reflection, you might be stuck at the previous um action and then you will move on. So with self-reflection, you can move to the next action, which is awesome. Yeah, this is a self-adapting, self-learning system. I, I like it a lot. Task inference is to say that, hey, uh, whether or not I should change my task or not. If you don't have this task inference thing, you, you may not be able to say that, hey, you know, I should go to the next task. Like after I shire the horse, I should lead the horse. So you can see that there's improvement as well. Okay. One thing, okay, like all this are the this is the tough, the tough stuff, right? Even with self-reflection, even with task inference, we still cannot do this task well. It, like, it's, it's like a random success rate, like 40. I mean, 40 is not too bad already, given that this task can be open-ended. Buying supplies from the, the store, this is so open-ended. You need to go to the store owner. You need to see the drop-down menu, select the right item. So I think this is uh, the limitations. These are the limitations we can see for the current planning. Open-ended stuff. We don't really have a planning uh, mechanism that's well enough yet. And I think this is because uh, right now we don't store a text of when to use the action. And also you don't store like uh, sequences of actions. I mean, maybe you can store them as code, but you know, sometimes you want to store sequences of actions in raw form. Like for example, go to store, buy item, leave store, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So it's missing a few other things like different abstraction spaces for your memory for your abstraction spaces. You don't only want to store code, you also want to store like different levels of abstraction. Uh, one level is could, you, could be just like this kind of plain text thing that can help to guide you to the next step. Uh, like if I want to buy stuff from the store, you know, if I have this thing here, at least it can guide me how to do my actions. I might buy different items, it's fine. But you know, at least I know the generic step. And then like, if each step fails, I can correct them individually. If I put all this into one code, if any part fails, you know, the code isn't going to correct itself, right? Yeah, so it's better to you know store in this, in this form, like when to use the action, like you could have some mapping of memory, like buy supplies to be like go to store. Yeah, so if, if you have more ways to map what you see in the environment to an action, and this action may not even be the code level action. It could be the more abstract level actions. I think what you will see is that you will see that this uh, these things here would actually go up even more. If we have different abstraction spaces to store the actions, and then we put these abstraction spaces to, so, um, to the GPT itself. So I don't think it's a matter of LMs not being capable, capable enough to, to do this decision making. It's that we didn't give it the right space to make the decision in. So right now the space is purely following the text at the bottom of the screen, and that is not sufficient for open-ended tasks. We need to queue more of this kind of higher order thinking in the form of memory, in the form of like storing what has been done in the past, store in a more generic and abstract form so that you can use it for more tasks in the future. Yeah, I think this is quite exciting. So this is exactly the kind of area I'm interested to research into, how to augment memory with different abstraction spaces. And you know, once we can do that, I think we can solve this game. Right, so looking forward to that. Any anything before I move on? Okay, so the thing is, uh, given this game, like, it's one of the triple A games, and it's supposed to be difficult for decision making. Are the levels that they chose in this paper hard for decision making? So, so this is the point I emphasized earlier. Maybe it's not too hard, you know, because like it's just following this instruction. All right. So if you remove that instruction and you can still do the task. I'll applaud them, okay? Because that means we have solved the higher order planning. Next, there's actually a built-in minimap. <laughs> so the game doesn't like leave you the lurch, you know, like some, some first-person shooter, you know, you turn left and right. You need to memorize, oh, the wall is behind me, the enemy is behind me. But in this game here, it actually gives you a compass with like all the different like locations and so on. So it's, in some sense, this is a little cheating because uh, for humans, we don't have this minimap, you see? But actually, most games, they provide mini-map because like, it can be hard for a player to visualize what's around them if they only see the front. But this is also this also means that if we want to do this for real life, uh, this is not going to be sufficient yet. Because, you know, in, in, in uh, animals, like, we actually store play cells to tell you, like, oh, uh, where exactly 
am I? So if I'm at this place sells this this cell might fire maybe, and also there's grid cells that like if you are in a certain grid location you might fire. So this is like the mammal inbuilt um GPS. <laughs> so these are some stuff that you know. Do we need to do we need to replicate place cells grid cells? Okay, actually my answer is no <laughs> because this is the biological way of representing it. You know, right now if you want to build smart systems, right? Actually, I just use GPS. <laughs> so I, I do think that like uh maybe maybe not having this uh inbuilt mechanism to do location, maybe it's not that bad after all. Like you can use GPS, you can use uh use compass, you know, like to tell you where you are in the XY coordinate, XYZ coordinate, and then you have a direction. Yeah, and maybe you could just use that and then that could be the same as the minimap. So yeah, I, I anyone has any points on this? Do you think it's fair that uh we use the minimap for this game? Or you think this is perfectly all right? Like in, in a real life uh AGI system is it's okay because we can give it sensory information. Uh, we we can you, know, you can synthesize a map on the fly explicitly and provide that as a feedback back into a, an AGI system. Right. Uh, you know, the, these affordances to give them its proper name, they all they're the reason why rats are really and people are really good at location is to find food and shelter. Right? So an AGI doesn't have that problem. Right? So we'll need a different focus for the system. Right. The the you know, we evolution has meant that you know mammals are really interested in food and shelter. Really. <laughs> and water and other stuff like that. <laughs> um because you know back when we were sort of you know multi celled organisms and so on, evolutionary speaking, we still had that we originally had the problem and it hasn't changed since. Right? The that's been a, a theme of the development of humans. The themes of the development of AGI are quite different. Uh, that the, what makes a fit AGI is not finding food and shelter, strictly speaking. But at the same time, there is a real survivor bias. Uh, the people are looking to build the AI solution that meets their wants and needs. So that's going to drive the, you know, for want of a better term, indexing of memories and ideas i think to a large extent we'll continue with these cybernetic approaches where we just m model the the things we've got in front of us because we don't have any other model to work with but i think we, as you were touching on we just shouldn't be afraid to go no that's not how this is going to work right at some point we do need to go yeah you know, it's a different technology it has different biases and different needs and different strengths so play to them We've got enough problems without doing. Yeah. So I my my feel is that you know if the minimap module can be defined by rule based systems like you know store because right now we have robots that can scan the house and then retain the information right. Uh, we can just use those systems as the backbone to you know augment the agent. So this could be a module in the agent. I mean, it could be totally rule based. It's fine. You know, uh, I don't think we have to learn from scratch. So we just do what is needed. For the agent to get the right information, so I I think this is fine. I'm just highlighting that. That's why I say like, oh, you know, um, we have different systems that as done in biology is fine. Uh, we could replicate biology as well, but you know that's a difficult problem, and that's a problem that we may not need to do. Yeah. So for practical systems, we do whatever works. <laughs> so yeah, I'm 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 totally in alignment with uh with you here, and uh I just want to put this slide here just to highlight that, you know. We may not, uh, it, there might be some cheats in the game, like this easier stuff to like, tell you, though, you're yeah, in this house, there's people behind you. But you could easily just compile this information yourself with just some predefined module, and you still get the same minimap. So I think um, it's fine. In the AGI system, whatever they did, RDR2, although it's easy, but you know, if you augment the right information, you might still get the same outcome. All right. So uh, these are some thoughts I have. LMs are not good for long horizon planning. Maybe you need some rule based planner, okay, and also you need some uh, abstraction space that can that can store the right the right stuff to store higher level thinking. All right, then uh, for success checker, if they don't rely on the LM to use the screen to check, you can also use like a list of plan actions. 
So after you break the task down into subtasks, you know, you may be able to use that subtask completion as a, a rubric to see whether you have met your overall task. So this is done in task gen. So I think something like this um, they could do to make the log horizon planning better. Next vision module is still a pain point in AGI systems. So the current AGI system, uh, current vision module they use takes a latency like that is 20 times slower than humans, like maybe 20 seconds, I guess. Yeah, and also loses too much specific object information, you know. So you might need multiple abstraction spaces to preserve those position information. Um, so like what they did with grounding Dino and the grounding Dino, which is the bounding box, and also the the multi template matching. I think these are important stuff to do. And uh, the other things we need to do is to improve the latency of the vision processing system. So this can be done with tech advancements. So right now, you ask me, I put this vision module on a robot. Am I confident to like maybe do self-driving cars or you know, uh, let it play real-time first-person shooter games? My answer is no, the latency is just too great. But I think this can be solved with greater tech and with this multiple abstraction spaces in vision. Okay, prompts are still too long in Cradle. Okay, so I think what they did here is that they tried to stuff every single thing, every if else condition into the prompt. Uh, the problem is actually quite worthy. Uh, one thing I recommend the authors to do is to do task-based context prompting. So what this means is that based on your tasks, extract top K instructions. So uh, these instructions are modular. Like uh, basically, like maybe one can teach about the menu. One can teach about like uh, task ex uh, like the the current uh activity and so on so, so based on like activity like let's say you got to mount a horse then i can extract out the relevant module of how to mount the horse and put in the instruction so in some sense your prompt here is a mix and match so rather than have a fixed prompt you have different parts of the prompt here that can be like using rack or something like that you can actually select your you can actually augment your prompt using rack so this will be this is what i call dynamic on the fly prompt tuning uh, there's this module, uh, I'm not sure if you all heard of it, uh, it's called DSPY. It's also trying to do something like that, like you on, on the fly, you you augment your prompts with certain things. And in task gen, okay, in task gen with the memory module, you can do that as well. You can you can like dynamically retrieve parts of your prompt based on relevance to your tasks. I think stuff like that will help to reduce the context length dramatically and make the uh, prompt more focused. So, this is a suggestion I have. I, I think this is the way to go, actually. And the last thought I have is that AGI, you know, maybe not that general. You need to imbue a lot of local contacts, few short prompts. You need all the base priors according to context. Yeah. Okay, that's it for this slide. Any thoughts? Okay. So yeah, I think it's a little late already. I'm down to my last slide. So maybe we spend about five minutes on the last discussion slide. So um, this basically asks what are the things that could be done better for, for Cradle, all right? So uh, the first part here uh, is about vision. So what abstraction spaces are needed for audio, or sorry, for video or image? I mean, I just give like my my rough take position of important type of objects. So I think they already did it here. Uh, overall scene awareness, movement of uh, main objects. So there are some stuff like this. I think this is lacking. <laughs> so maybe that's why you know it cannot do the shooting stuff well, because if the target moves, you need to know how to aim it well and so on. So there are, of course, other things that you need for video and so on. But I think these are the main things that we kind of need to know. I think that's probably to go with it, you start getting into questions like pose estimation and um like the you, know, you said there's the mini map, but actually that doesn't work in the game, honestly doesn't work that well. But you you can you need to develop a mental map of your surroundings, including the other the other sort of AI characters and what they're doing. So you need to, and then you get into the question of, of which are they trying to sneak up on you? Are they trying to surround you? So there's a strategic element. These come out sort of, not strategic, but tactical, probably more accurate. A tactical 
the things that come out as you process what you've learned and you've planned and so on. And by reprocessing, you develop more and more abstract ideas about what's going on around you. And, you know, it's a game. It's designed so that you have constantly new discoveries. Um, it's designed... That's not very bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, and it doesn't always play fair. Right? Sometimes it, it, people will just pop into existence behind the door and and then open the door and come and shoot you because that's what happens in computer games. Yeah. It's and so it doesn't have to... They, you know, they make up the rules. They don't have to play by them. Um, and so there's a lot of... Um, where, like a well-made computer game hides where the game begins and ends. But they all have problems, bugs and so on, where they do just spawn bad guys, hopefully out of sight. Sometimes in sight, they just go, bing, in front of you. Um, <laughs> That's not really security, yeah. Yeah, so the, the goal is suspension of disbelief for a player, but it's not always successful. In an AI you've sorry i'm getting off the track a little bit but you've you've got the the abstraction spaces become one of the questions becomes what is the designer or the writer attempting here right and so because it you know it's a constructed space it's a constructed problem and so you can second guess what's supposed to happen even if it doesn't look like that's going on on the screen yeah i think um, that that's that's important point here because different environments have different ways of processing them, right? Like uh, VR versus real life. And our brains, we form some form of mental model of the world after a while that will be used to decipher. So that will be a new abstraction space that we form on the fly that will be used to decipher the meaning of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah back, back to you, Richard. Yeah, you were, you were saying oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the interesting things that makes this a particularly good computer game is it's very well written, right? There is a character arc and stories and you know, they're, they're interesting and affecting and there's morally ambiguous choices to be made. And I think, you know, if we had a GI, like properly general, then it would reflect on those choices. It, it will be faced with moral choices in this game right? because that's how it's written. And the, the, it's not a, so the, when you talk about abstraction spaces, it becomes extremely abstract. It stops being about the game and about the rest of the world because it, because it's well written, and I think that's the 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 sort of the challenges here are, you know, that that's why people enjoy playing this game. That's why it's a particularly famous, considered a particularly well made game, um, because of all these things which aren't strictly speaking on screen. They happen yeah. in the mind of the player, and. We talk about abstraction spaces. That's where we we're working on, right? In my mind. Yeah, you know, you made me think of this experiment where you know they ask people to view like a triangle and like a circle, and then like the, the and then the square is bullying the triangle. I can't remember the specifics, but like one shape is bullying the other, and then they ask the participant like, actually not really bullying, just bumping, and then they would people interpret like, oh, the square is bullying the triangle. So it appears that even in our mental models, we have this idea of agency of what other people are doing and whether is it good or not. Like, and I think what you say is very true. Like, it might be just a sequence of images on the video, but there's some hidden meaning behind it that we abstract out because of how our brains are developed. Like, we we, we tend to think of other objects having agency. That's why people anthropomorph anthropomorphize. Uh, GPT that easily, like the Google engineer thinks that the LM is sentient. Like we give our own views to that object saying that, hey, you know, this object is talking to me. Uh, that is uh I think something that we are lacking right now in current AI systems. We don't really like have this worldview of like what other people are doing to us and so on. So I, I think there's a technical name for it. I can't remember what it is, but then in the Sparks of AGI paper, they Sparks of AGI, they talked about like how it has a mental model of the world. And, but that, that's very limited. I think right now the AI doesn't have that awareness because it's not really embodied in this world. It's, it's just looking at text and then inferring it. So maybe in order to solve like video domains completely, we might need an embodied agent to like, know how the interactions are. Or at least, you know, like when you see this kind of image, you know that like, oh, um, 
it's not just shapes bumping to one another, maybe one of them is bullying the other and so on. So that can give you additional context of like, oh, this is a good person, this is a bad person. Like, in fact, our notions of good and bad are also like not very well defined. It's really based on context and so on. Uh, that's that's not a lot to model, like uh, very, very context dependent. Yep. And I, 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 yeah. I wonder how much modeling is the right term for it. But I mean, the, the, there's a lot of, um, so there's, it's a context dependent, but the context is everything. Right. The the whole point of the video in the game is to create an illusion of a three dimensional world and a two dimensional screen, which is often but not always successful. Right? And likewise, so it encourages you by looking at a two dimensional picture to a, develop a three dimensional model in your mind. So one of the comments that somebody made in the in Discord was, "Oh, look, it's it's it's." referring to this 3D scene must be doing depth perception or something. No, no, it's not. Yeah, just things a bit bigger or smaller because that's as smart as it gets, not further or closer because it's still a two-dimensional picture. And so the abstraction space is three dimensions. And then once you get from there, you go through, you abstract out over time, color, and whatnot. So there's, even before we get GPT 4V is going through a, a whole bunch of different abstractions to get to the point where it can go um, and recognize items in the scene. And then the um, the grounding Dino was doing finding bounding boxes. So all of that encapsulates a lot of prior knowledge of context. And I think um, those each of them represents actually possibly dozens of abstraction spaces. And so if we try to to list them, my concern is that you you must be getting it wrong because if you're definite, then it's almost certainly wrong. If that makes sense. And it's an indefinite outcome. Yeah, I think there might be many abstraction spaces, but if you could specify in some rule based format how to extract certain parts of it, I think it'll make the problem easier. Like, you know, how to oh, yeah. the map, how to process the object movement. I think if you can compartmentalize it, yeah, that will help a lot with the system. Uh, of course, like in the most generic uh, abstraction, you can't characterize it because it's maybe all vectors and so on. But at least there should be some useful information for different kind of uh, processings. And um, that's exactly the kind of question I'm asking here. Like, how should we process it? And uh, you know what? I even have this uh, thinking that how we choose to process this uh, like input spaces can be largely unchanged throughout life. Like, the way we anthropomorph anthropomorphize stuff as humans, we do that throughout life. There's there's no changing it, and it could be very well that you know because of that we can only perceive things in a certain way and not another, but we don't realize it because that's how we always perceive it. So maybe fixed abstraction spaces already predefined and pre-given are good to solve uh, problems within that space, but we cannot really shift our lens outside of that space because. These are all the tools that we have used to process it, and it's very hard to do so. Uh, I mean, take for example, viewing infrared. Like, we don't have the abstraction space to view infra infrared because, like, we don't have that sensory stimuli. But you give yourself some infrared goggles, and you know, you can see things, but we don't see things as infrared, you see? We see things as, like, some image. <laughs> and then, like, the way we process it will be very different from some um, animal with inbuilt infrared sensors that, that can react. To those because th those are like to them it's not an image it's just a, a sense like there's really some sensor that detects infrared or uv light yeah but we you replace it with the image input for us i i don't think it would have the same kind of effect because we will try to map it to the the way we interpret images rather than a new sensory input like uh, david Igerman did some experiments they tried to like convert for those blind people convert uh image sensory to some electro on the tongue or some like pat on the on the chest to you know tell you like, oh there's an object then some some vibrations will happen on your chest. Yes, you will get awareness of the image, but the way you process it using your touch sensor may may be different from how you process it using vision. Yeah, I mean people say the brain is plastic and so on, but you know, I believe for different input stimuli, you know the the way you process stuff like the visual context is different from the 
the way you process touch. Yeah. Not too sure whether you know like your touch information can go to the visual cortex. I have to go and read more on that. But yeah. Uh, my point is that I think the abstraction spaces are kind of fixed from birth, and that will impact how you process things. Okay, yeah. Anyway, that, that's a very profound discussion. We can talk more next time. Uh, so for memory of stuff, also there's abstraction spaces, like you can have a low level Python code for actions and a higher level broad actions, uh, broad names for actions. Yeah, so there are different ways to store it. And I think because they only focus on the low level one, it's not able to do long-term planning because we, we lack the higher level abstraction for that planning. Of course, there are many other ways to do uh, this uh, abstraction space, uh, summarization, you know, but there are many levels of summarization and also like uh, what temporal aspect of to do. So there's a lot of things to, the a lot of design choices here um, that I think is not really solved yet, but this is at least the first step towards that. Uh, question, uh, any, uh, any pointers to put for this memory part? Okay, if not, uh, let's go on. So the next one is, can the problem be better solved with sub-agents, okay? So instead of just doing everything as one agent, I could have many specialized agents that I already know, like one agent can navigate, one agent can shoot, one agent can purchase items and so on. And you know, these agents learn from the different contexts. So it's like the context is shooting, then this agent will use that contextual information to enrich what actions that they need to do, whatever actions they perform, they learn from experience and then they do some reflection and then make their action of shooting better maybe or navigating better right so this the question is rather than one big agent could having multiple sub agents that are specialized be better yeah so uh any thoughts on that oh, i think it has to be some version of that i think particularly when it comes to the latency just in terms of performance so the the, the Even the yeah. way that the, 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 even in biological systems, we have quite different systems depending on the time scale. The 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 time it takes to react to a touch on your skin versus the sight is I forget what it is, but maybe ten per second or something. But it's quite significant if you're depending on what's going on. Um, if you look at you know, flies, if you try and spot a fly. They have a hardwired jump reflex into the, the wires on their, not the wires, the hairs on their back. So they feel you coming for them through as air movement. And with, and, and there's a, it automatically makes them jump. They don't know it's them fly. There's no cognition really anyway. But the, the reason why they so often get out of the way is because that's how they're built. There are there are these specialized systems, and timing seems to be a particularly key thing. They're going, well, we'll need to optimize that a bit, particularly timing and survival. Yeah. Really key relationship. Yeah. So I, I, I think we also agree that like there might be sub-modules. Okay, but based on like the architecture of the brain, you know, there's no distinct region like, hey, this is for for um like eating, this is for drinking. I mean, you use a lot of the same pathways, but I think for higher level wise, maybe all these are done with the same agent. Okay, although I say sub agents here, but maybe it's the same agent, just different memory as context, then they and different skills as context, and then there will be separate agents already. Yeah, so where sub agents here, it need not be separate physical agents, but it just means that different memory, different action spaces. If we can have a context dependent memory, context dependent action space, I think that would solve the problem also. So. I am quite hopeful for this approach because I mean this kind of approach works well for the arc challenge also. I think it would work well for this cradle. You know, cradle did not do context dependent memory, did not do context. I mean context dependent action spaces it did. So it did the action space part correctly. But the context dependent memory part to imbue past knowledge is not really done. So I think with that, it would be able to solve more problems. I, I that's why I feel because the problem is really too long, yeah, for cradle. Okay, uh, next question. How can we reduce latency for decision making? I think this one is uh is you have to blame the vision module. <laughs> but but anyway, like, like main latency is the vision module. So how to improve it? No, just improve uh latency for video processing. So yeah. I think this but also I'd say specialization is often 
the often a key. Right? So um, yeah, and and there's a, there's a variety of performance tuning, which is a conversation I had earlier today. That's entirely separate, but um, the performance tuning is always about picking your your key requirement and then kind of sacrificing everything else to get that. Yeah. So uh, I I do think this latency part is a problem we will solve, but maybe not today. Maybe five years down the road, the video processing latency will be less than a second. And then this kind of AGI systems based on video would be very viable. So more research need to be done on this front to improve latency. I can already see people moving towards that. Better hardware, like one bit uh, LFs maybe. So that that that's something that could you know make the uh processing speed much faster. In fact, for video, you may not need to process all the pixels. You can also like group the pixels together, and then you might be able to batch process faster. Yeah. So so there are different ways to do it, and with multiple abstraction spaces, maybe you don't need the high res picture anymore. You could just uh subdivide your images into small small parts to process. I mean, like vision transformers, they process into patches, right? You could do the same for UI element boxes and so on, you know. Maybe you just need to detect where are the different elements, then you process each of them separately. You know, you might re reduce the latency a lot than pro processing one big high res image, which takes a long time. All right. So yeah, the last question is how can the system learn the correct actions without the game prompts? All right. The thing is, maybe what you need to do is uh maybe just have a list of general actions that can be generally mappable to most processes. So like, for example, how to use Google Maps, how to use, uh, how to go to Lazada to shop or like some, some shopping app, a Shopee or something like, how, how do you use, how do you go that? They don't exactly teach you, oh, I need to use the type of the search bar and so on. The thing is for smartphones or like websites, we already have priors of how to use it. Like, for example, a text box means you need to type something. A button means you need to click, right? So, so you need to like basically uh, have some knowledge about how things are done in general and then use that prior knowledge and you can really know what actions to do even without learning the action from the site. Like, so if we assume the notion that most of the skills are reusable in the interface and we design the interface as such, maybe we don't need to learn the actions anymore. All we need to do is to map the right actions to the user intent. And I, I, I think whatever they did in Cradle here is specific because uh, to, to this game, because this game teaches you like in the game itself, like press this button to do that, press this button to do that. But I think for a general like web surfing agent and so on, you don't expect the website to teach you what to do, right? Yeah. You expect that the website will just follow convention. Like this is a password username. So, you know, that, that must be a username, password entry, and they click log in. Yeah. So, so they follow that kind of convention. So do we need prior knowledge? Yes, we need prior knowledge to tell us what to do. How much prior knowledge? Quite a lot actually. Like, uh, so the thing is you need a lot more prior knowledge if you don't explore. Okay, so this is a point I need to have. Like even for app agent, they have an exploration phase to build up this knowledge. So if your system you need to perform straight away, well, you need a lot of prior knowledge to guide it to choose the right action without much exploration. Because exploration takes time, it's costly, you, know, you may not explore fully to what you want. So most of the time, like even for games, we don't explore fully, we just read the guidebooks. Okay, I mean, at least for me, if I get stuck at a game for like close to a day, I'll just read the guidebook. Yeah, so, so this prior knowledge, I think is very important because it helps you guide your actions and uh, you need to build it up through constant observation and exploration of the world. That there's no shortcut for that. Or expert guidebooks. Like if you have expert documentation on like Minecraft, this is the way to craft your recipe. You, know, you don't have to try and error it. Right? Probably the first few people try and error it many, many times. And but eventually this gets codified into knowledge and people can use it. So I don't think a system without prior knowledge will work. You will need prior knowledge for that specific task. Okay, so that was the last question. Any other comments to make before we conclude the session today? All right, if not, yeah, thanks so much for staying all the way. I know we dragged for half an hour, but I hope uh, it was a useful discussion.
Uh, overall, I think Cradle is a very good system. Um, it helps to do reasoning, planning, reflection, and so on. And overall, it's a self-learning system, although the weak part of large language models here is the planning. And this planning could perhaps be better solved with better uh, levels of abstraction in the planning space, and also maybe with uh, better ways of imbuing different abstraction uh, memory spaces into the planner. Okay, but overall, learning how to use the image and processing it to one coherent pipeline, I think that's quite remarkable. And yeah, I, we must commend the authors to make even this tutorial level work, which is not easy already. Yeah. Okay, with that, uh, I'll end today's session. Thanks for coming. Okay. Bye. Bye.